So let's go to Exodus chapter 13, verse number 20. So they took their journey from Sukkoth and encamped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. Everybody say the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way. And by night, a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. I have been wanting to preach about the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night for a long time now. I've made reference to it, but to just preach from the text where it is, I have not. And I have just searched the scriptures and uh, looked at different things there's, there's not a lot of detail about the cloud and the fire other than what we see that it is in the scripture. And that was leading the way. So I want us to take all of these interesting statements here, starting with, the edge of the wilderness. This is the beginning of their journey. The Lord went before them. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud. That was the Lord. The pillar of fire by night. That was the Lord. He didn't take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before them. He wanted them, to, whenever he wanted them to go, this is what he would use to lead them and to guide. Hallelujah. I'll, I'll give you a title just a little bit later, but let's start here. Let's start here today. Lord, I love you. I thank you for your word. Thank you for your power, your presence. Thank you for meeting here with us today. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, touch me today, strengthen me so that I can preach and be an inspiration to someone. Anoint me and anoint every one of us in this place. And we're going to give you praise and glory and honor for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You may be seated. May the Lord bless you. If you uh, follow me on uh, social media, then you know that for McKendra's 16th birthday, she wanted a, uh, a motorcycle ride to uh, East Tennessee where they have what's called uh, the Tail of the Dragon. And uh, that's 318 curves in 11 miles. It is a thrill ride, I promise you that. And uh, so... Uh, that's what we did. We did that. We went to Cherokee. We spent the night there, got up the next day, and rode what's called the Cherahala Skyway, which was about 23 miles. 20, well, I think it was closer to 40, but uh, absolutely uh, beautiful scenery, breathtaking, mountains just rolling uh, there. So if you've ever been to the Gatlinburg area, seen the Smoky Mountains, Blue Ridge, all of that, you know what I'm talking about. So that's that's, uh, that's what we did. We had some friends that went with us. The Thomases went with us, and Brother Brad, Ava was there with us, and uh, Brother Barry as well. So we had, a, we had a wonderful time, but I was thinking, I was thinking about our, 
about our trip uh, this weekend. And uh, every, uh, everywhere we went, I, I mapped it out and, and made sure and put it in my phone into the GPS system. And I don't know, I just got to thinking, how, you know, how did we, of course, I don't know if you use it much or not, but I, I, you know, how did we live before that GPS? I mean, it's such an amazing tool that we can use wherever you want to go. You know, if you want to, used to be when you wanted to meet somebody somewhere, you'd have to come up with a location and, and uh, you'd have to try to figure out that address. Now, now you, 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 you go down this road and then you, and, and, and I'm going to tell you, not everybody is blessed with giving directions. I don't know if you know that or not, but not everybody can give you directions. Uh, uh, some, I, we had one uh, person giving us directions and, and told us, go down this way and said, now when you, when you see that uh, landmark, uh, don't do anything, just keep going. And I, I, I thought, well, why in the name of God you t- tell me about that landmark? Uh, you're distracting me. So not everyone is, is, is blessed. Did anybody ever used to write down directions for somebody? Uh, you're going to bring them to your house. You can let them know. And you, and you try to draw it out, what it's going to. A lot of these young folks, they don't understand that because they're so used to the GPS. And we are so spoiled by it. And it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Tell, some of us just tell our age. How many remember the days of the folded maps? <laughs> Brother Ronnie, it was the first hand. <laughs> I'm talking about the folded maps. Now, now my dad, that's what he had when we traveled. The glove compartment was just full of these folded maps because, you know, you had to have so many states in one or uh, eastern part of the water. You know, it, it, was, it was done by regions. And, and you, you were not supposed to try to figure out your way while you're driving Be, because when that bad boy folds out, it's like a blanket in the car. And so you'd, you'd have to pull over, you know, and dad would start unfolding the, that map, you know. It'd be all across the dash in the front there and, and uh, you know, they'd be doing this right here. You know, Gloria, where, now where, well, Dean, we're right here. We're right here. We need to, and then there was, all, you know, you didn't have anything like fastest route or, you know, quickest route or, uh, you know, you just, you, you had to figure that out, your, out yourself. And so you'd highway this or interstate, and then you got to connect to this. And boy, if you make a bad turn, that folded map would not say recalculating few miles down the road, you might hear my mom say, I told you you took the wrong road. <laughs> and so we'd have to pull back over, and here we'd go, unfolding that. Now, here's what I did. Now, now what, Well, now we're going to have to go down. And, oh, but then, then, then we upgraded and ran McNally. You remember that powerful name? Rand McNally came up with what was called a road at Atlas. That was one large book, right? And all 50 states and major cities was all in that book. That was the greatest book known to mankind. How many remembers when it switched from folded maps to the travel? Wasn't that great? I went online today and, and said, pictures of Rand McNally atlases. And boy, they started coming up. And it was like, boy, that, when I was evangelizing by myself, even my wife and I, we started evangelizing. That's, that's what we'd use. And so we'd, man, you could, you, could open that, you could open that up and just, you know. And, and, and the thing that I loved about it in the very back, it had, it had major cities, the mileage between them. 
you know, and from Detroit to Cincinnati. You could go in the back back there, and you, and, and you could see how, how far that was. Man, I thought that was, that was the coolest thing uh, that, that, you, that you could uh, possibly have. But my mother-in-law told me the other day, she said, I still prefer them road atlases. She said, I, I know all this technology is good, but I still prefer those road atlases. And they, and they were, they were, they were uh, interesting, and, and it helped us so very much. Uh, but now we have something that I have one on my, um, on my motorcycle, the screen there, and then I have my phone right to the left of me. And I'll usually have my directions on both GPS systems. Just because I, I don't want to mess up, I want to make sure that I'm going the right way. When I was traveling by myself, <clears throat> they're, they're, like I said earlier, some people can't give good directions. And uh, there were a lot of pastors that couldn't give good directions. So I come into a town and I'd call, brother so-and-so, I'm here, I just need to know where to go. Well, the church is at such and such address. See, nowadays that's all you do. Our church is such and such an address. You type that in your GPS, boom, I'll, I'll be right there. But back then, they had to give directions. Now, you're going to go down by the Hardys, and then you're going to turn right, and then you're going to go up by uh, George's house. Well, you don't know George, do you? So uh, then you're going <laughs> to... And, and so, listen to me. I guess the reason I'm so addicted to a GPS is I hate getting lost. That is the worst feeling in the world. I'll never forget, my wife and I were traveling one time. Well, I'm jumping everywhere, ain't I? I'm so sorry. We were traveling. We was, going, we was headed to Louisiana to preach a revival. Brittany was just a little thing. And we were going through Mississippi, and it was late. It was about midnight. And I turned down this, I think it was Rand McNally's fault, to be honest with you. But I turned down this road, and as soon as I turned down this road, I knew it was the wrong road. And I was in our truck and a 40-foot fifth wheel. There was no way out. There was nowhere. It wasn't a major road where I could just pull up somewhere, turn around. And so here I am in the middle of nowhere, and I'm going to have to back up. See, not everybody understands what backup means when you say a 40-foot, Coda knows what I'm talking a 40-foot fifth wheel. And I'm telling you, I was in the middle of, I think I saw Freddy Krueger. <laughs> Children of the Corn or something. I'm, I'm tell, and, 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 I, and I'm going to just shoot straight with you. I'm a chicken. I'm a coward. When it's dark, I want to be where it's light. I don't want to be out in the middle of the woods where Jason can come. <laughs> you looking for something, mister? I, 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 I don't want that. I get scared. I run. <laughs> and so, listen to me. I got out of that truck. I knew I had to. Put on a brave face, you know. My wife's there and my daughter's there. And, and so, well, let me go back here. And say, Man, I'm telling you, whew, it was awful. And we had our windows down. Honey, you helped me on that side. And I had to back up all. So I, I, I guess I'm addicted to that GPS because I just hate getting lost. It's the worst. Not everybody can give direction. So I, I, love, I love where we are now that we have... <laughs> that we have this. Look, let me say this. The bottom line is your destiny is determined by your means of direction. Your destiny is determined by your means of direction. <clears throat> the Lord had a destiny for Israel. He had a plan for Israel. But he also had a GPS system for Israel. He didn't just put them in the wilderness and just say, well, go down to Georgia. Well, you don't know Georgia. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't tell them that. He, he, he gave them, and the Bible, the Bible lets us know in Exodus 20, that he gave them a pillar of cloud 
by day and a pillar of fire by night. As each day would roll around when it was time to move, and every time they moved, it was moving closer to destiny. It was getting closer to where he had planned for them to be. And if it was in the daytime, that cloud would appear and they would follow that cloud. If it was at nighttime, that's the same thing would happen. It would be a pillar of fire that would show up and it would direct them. What a, what a powerful, what a powerful thing. And, 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 and the Lord instructed and let Moses know, you make sure and tell the people, you watch the cloud and the fire. Pay attention to the cloud and the fire. It doesn't matter what happens uh, day after day. You watch the cloud and the fire. Get things set up and, and all of that for your homes. And, and God provided food for all of them. But you make sure that you watch the cloud and the fire. You pay attention to that cloud and that fire. It's the only time in the word of God that a system like this is set up. It's so unique. It's so powerful. And he wanted them to watch it. Don't know what's going to happen in this wilderness. Don't know what's going to happen from day to day. Don't know what's going to happen with you. Don't know the kind of emotions or feelings or uh, things you might have to deal with. But don't, don't worry about that. Just watch the cloud and the fire. Pay attention to the cloud and to the fire. Not only, and I told you earlier, there's not a lot of details. There's some opinions about the cloud and the fire. But it's open for uh, interpretation, open for discussion. We know that it was the Lord because he said that. He said it was, it was the Lord that led them cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. Not only did the cloud lead them, but that same cloud protected and comforted them. That interesting that the cloud is also a comforter, that the cloud is also a protector. And the same at nighttime when it would get cold, that fire would warm them. So uh, these two elements that God used became what led them, but also protected them and also comforted them. This means that God had provided everything they needed to reach their destiny in the cloud and the fire. Pay attention to that cloud. Pay attention to that fire because that's taking you to your destiny. Don't take advantage of it. Watch it. If you desire destiny and if you want to be where God wants you to be, then you watch the cloud and you watch the fire. You pay attention to what's going on with the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Would you say amen? amen. So not only did he set it up for the cloud and the fire, but I also find it interesting how the Lord set up the marching order. He did not just put Israel out in that wilderness and just say, all right, let's get in a single file line or let's, let's all just get together and march. No, sir. The Lord had it set for all the tribes of Israel for them to be in a specific order. You don't just jump in wherever. You have a place. You have a place and a purpose, and God has strategically set this up. And this is what, this is how you follow the cloud by day and the fire by night. The first tribe is the tribe of Levi. The Levites represent the ministry. They were the ones that ministered in the tabernacle. 
They were the ones that uh, instructed the people and gave to them the word of God and would, do, uh, and would teach and, and share with them what they needed to know. This is, these are the ones that served in the tabernacle when they began to put that together. After that came the tribe of Judah. Judah was known as the tribe of the praisers. After Judah was the tribe of Issachar. What I find interesting about the tribe of Issachar is the Old Testament says that their talent and their gift was they understood the times. <laughs> they understood the times. So you had, you had the ministry, the worshipers, and those that understood the time. Then the rest of the tribes, you can, you can look up the order of them. I won't go into all of that, but I just thought it was interesting. Those, those three are very important, those first two. That's very, so, so these tribes, the Levites, the tribe of Judah, watch the cloud, watch the fire. And then in behind them, all the other tribes watching, watching and paying attention. So you have the cloud, you have the fire. Then, then in Exodus 25, the Bible says that God gave instructions for the tabernacle and for the furniture of the tabernacle and specifically the ark of the covenant. The ark of the covenant. Now let me, let me tell you something about the ark of the covenant. This represented the presence of Jehovah God. This was a symbol of God being with them. His presence. It also symbolized his provision, his mercy, his anointing. There was so much in the ark. But, but the main thing you, you had to understand was it, it represented God himself, it, his presence, when that, when that ark was there, you would feel the presence of God. It was very, very powerful. Now, the reason I bring up the ark is something stood out to me about the ark that I never really noticed before till this week. And that is the cloud or the fire when they were to move, you have the tribe of Levi. Once they built the ark, once they made the ark, God told Moses to instruct the Levites to carry, because on the sides of that ark were golden rings, and then there were staves that would go through those golden rings. And no one was, you, you could not touch the ark. It represented the presence and the power of God. And you couldn't lay your hands on that. If you touched it, you would, you would die. In fact, there was a, uh, there was a man that, that did die because he touched the ark of the covenant. So anyway, with these staves there going through those uh, those golden rings on the side. The Levites, those that were instructed to carry, they would reach down and they would pick up that ark with the staves and put it on their shoulders. They would carry the ark of the covenant. So, that would mean that the Levites, you had an average size man among the Israelites. So the Levites were no different. There were no tribe that was taller than the other. They were all around the same size. So when they would put the ark on their shoulders, that means that the ark would be higher than their height. It would be taller than what they were. Now, this is what's interesting to me. 
I don't know where you think the cloud was or the pillar of fire was. Maybe you think that the cloud was just like another cloud and it was setting up above them. If the cloud was to lead them, you couldn't have the cloud. Where would you be going if the cloud was up here? If the cloud was leading them and the fire was leading them, that means it had to be in front of them. It had to be something that they could see to direct them. So every tribe that is behind the Levites, which is the rest of them, they would see, this is my opinion, they would see not only the cloud, but once they started, the Levites started carrying the ark, they would see the cloud or the fire through the presence of God. The, pre, the ark is now in, is a, the presence of God is now a part of the direction of God. The ark being so powerful and such an anointing, that anointing is now a part of the direction. The cloud is important. The fire is important because it's what is out front. And now the people have a visual. They are now seen because you can't see, you can't have direction without anointing. You can't have direction without the presence of God. And so they now visualize, they now see the cloud by day and the fire by night as they are, as they are looking at the ark of the covenant. And they knew what that ark represented. They understood what that ark and how powerful that ark was. Now, the cloud, the fire, and the ark, that's what's in front. The cloud, the fire, and the ark. It's all a part of their vision. So no matter what happens, keep your eyes on the cloud, the fire, and the ark. No matter what the weather begins to do, keep your eyes on the cloud, the fire, and the ark. It's his spirit. It's his direction. It's his presence. And he is leading and he is guiding you. If you want destiny, watch the cloud, the fire, and the ark. If you want to make it, watch the cloud the fire, and the ark. We don't know for sure when the cloud and the fire departed. But there is a place, there is a time in Scripture where we don't see the cloud and we don't see the fire. But we do see the ark. It is as if the cloud has departed, the fire has departed, but his presence has not departed. I just think that's, in, I just think that's interesting. Now, the cloud left and the fire left. And somewhere along the lines, according to history, the ark was taken. The ark was gone. And they no longer, God's people no longer had the ark of the covenant. Does that mean they didn't have the presence of God and all? It, it didn't mean that, but I will tell you this. If you understand the Old Testament, then you understand it's about types and shadows. It's about seeing what is literal in the old, comparing it to what is spiritual in the new. It is my opinion that the cloud and the fire, it's not, it's not in, in literal form, it's not in the New Testament because a change took place. 
And the change that took place is I believe that the cloud and the fire for direction, I, I believe that it is the Spirit of God. I believe that those things represent His Spirit. In John 16 and 13, notice this. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. The Spirit, he, that Spirit will lead and guide you into all truth. So he was preparing them. A change has taken place. You're not looking for a cloud. You're not looking for a pillar of fire. Jesus Christ, you need to understand, He, the Spirit of God, that's what will lead you and guide you into all truth. That's what will lead you and guide you and take you to your destiny. But what about the presence of God? What about the ark? Matthew 18 and 19 tells us, and there are several places we could have chosen from. But Matthew 18 and 19 tells us again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them, which is his presence. So we don't see that literal cloud. We don't see that literal pillar of fire. We don't see that ark, that literal ark of the covenant, but we see the spiritual analogy of all of them here. Would you say amen? If destiny is determined by direction, then how do we find that cloud, that fire, and that ark? If, if each of us are seeking our, our destinies that God has planned for us, then where do we find those? Where is the cloud? Where is the fire? And where is the ark? Where is the Spirit of God? And where is the presence of God? Where is it that we can find direction and, and, and get to that place of destiny. We need a place where all of them are there. One place where the Spirit of God will lead us, but where we can also feel His presence. A place where He can be felt, a place where He can be experienced. But it's also in that place where you find direction for your life. It's in that place where you find the route to destiny. Where you find out I'm not on this journey trying to figure out where I'm headed. But I am finding direction. And I feel the presence of God. Where is that place? That place started and was birthed in Acts chapter 2. The Bible tells us that 120 people were gathered together in an upper room. And they began to seek the Lord and they were all filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That means the Spirit of the Lord was in that room. That Spirit, the Bible says, that that the comforter was going to come. That it wasn't just the Spirit of God, but it was a comforter and that it was a protector. And when they were gathered together in that upper room and began to praise God and lift him up, the Spirit of the Lord hit that place and they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. There it is. There's the Spirit of God, and there is the presence of God. There is direction. 
Because if you follow the book of Acts from two on, you will find that it is his spirit and his presence that would guide the church. It was the disciples that would follow, keep their eyes on a specific place. What are you telling me? that I need to watch today, Pastor. What are you telling me that the disciples, what did they keep their eyes on? They kept their eyes on the church. They would watch the church. No matter what was going on, no matter what was happening, keep your eyes on the church. The disciples learned, don't watch tradition, don't watch politics, but watch the church. Wherever we need to go in whatever hour or whatever day, watch the church. Keep your eyes on the church. I want to tell you quickly today that it has not changed. Just as it was almost 2,000 years ago, the same is today. There are a lot of things transpiring, and there's a lot of things that are going on, but I want to encourage you, no matter what's happening, and no matter what the enemy is throwing your way, I want to encourage you today, watch the church. Keep your eyes on the church. Destiny is just up the road. Destiny is just up the way. Watch the church. <laughs> Hallelujah. I appreciate this place. Hallelujah. I appreciate the house of God. I appreciate the church of the living God. Where else can you go and in one place feel the mighty Shekinah presence of God, but at the same time, the cloud by day, the fire by night begins to guide and begins to direct and tells you, keep your eyes here. Keep your eyes right here. Stay on target with this. Oh, hallelujah. I want to say it again. Watch the church. Watch the church. Come on and clap your hands. Give him some glory. Oh, hallelujah. Why do you think the apostle Paul, God called him to the Gentiles to start church after church after church? Why do you think that he told them, you start in Jerusalem, then I want you to go to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world? Why do you want us to do that? I want you to establish churches. I saw someone the other day on, I don't know if it's TikTok or Facebook or whatever it was, and they were, they were saying there's, there's no biblical example for a church for people coming together. You know, I get it. And then they start in, you are the church, and, and blah, blah, blah. I, 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 I get that. I understand that church is uh, is a called out group of people. I realize that that we are the church. But why do you think God had them establish those local gatherings? Why do you think they met in specific places? Because God wanted them to have a place that they could keep their eyes on. That no matter in all of the craziness, in all of the strange things that are going to happen, there is one definite north star. There is one definite place that changes not. Keep your eyes on it and your family. Oh, hallelujah. Keep your eyes on the church and your family is safe. Keep your eyes on the church and your ministry is safe. Watch the church. Watch the church. In it is, a dir is direction. In it is safety. In it is protection and comfort. In it is the presence of God. In it is the anointing of God. You think that I just randomly pick some subject in the book? Oh, I think we could talk about this today. I seek the face of God and wait for his direction. Why? Why do I do that? Because you are, must be programmed 
to follow and watch the church. I'm a Levite. I'm a Levite spiritually, which means I carry the anointing. I carry the anointing on my shoulders. I don't pull it. I don't drive it, but I bear within my body the presence and the anointing of God. And you need to be able to see that ark. You need to be able to see the cloud through the presence of God. And I'm telling somebody today in this place, there are people in this room that are, that are struggling with direction. There are people in this room that are saying, I'm not sure which way to go. I'm I'm not sure exactly what to do. I come to tell you, watch the church. Keep your eyes on the church. It'll tell you where to go. It'll tell you which turn to make. I'm worried about my business. What do I do, pastor? Watch church. I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about the school system. I'm worried about crime. I'm worried about what do I do? Watch the church. <laughs> Get here and, and watch the church. It's going to direct you. It's going to tell you exactly where to go and what to do. There was a time the Old Testament, that the cloud was gone and the fire was gone. But the ark was not. Direction ceased, but presence remained. <laughs> Where they needed to go was not as important as what they were experiencing, which was the presence of the Lord. What are you telling me? There's a day coming when we will no longer need the cloud. We will no longer need the fire. We will no longer need direction. But one thing we will have. <laughs> is the presence of the Lord. We will step away from direction and we will step in forever and ever in the presence of the Almighty God. But you can't step into His presence without following His cloud. And today, the cloud is here. Today, the fire is here. Today, the comforter is here. And his presence is here. And one day, the GPS <laughs> will go away. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many. Step in to the joys or the presence of the Lord. That's why I watch the church. That's why I pay attention to the church because it's leading, to, leading me to my destiny and will eventually lead me into the presence of the Lord forever and forever.